I think that uh, uh, when you think about the competing, you know, objectives of policies, central bank uh, is focusing on price stability. That's what central bank needs to do. There are consequences of uh, policies, but then the issue is that, you know, there are political economy considerations as well. So the authorities need to basically look at these trade-offs and uh, make a decision. Right now, the Thai government seems to want to encourage Thai people to spend more to inject money into economy. So if you were to recommend this policy regarding interest rate, what do you like to tell? As the leading economist of World Bank Group, you must have heard so many stories of conflict. So mostly, how would you encapsulate that or how would you explain that kind of situation which will affect the economy of that particular country? What's the possibility that Thailand may be reduced or downgraded to low-income country? So what's the prospect you see about Thailand? คุณผู้ชมคะเป็นเรื่องสําคัญมากที่จะต้องตรวจสอบสภาพของเศรษฐกิจไทยท่ามกลางโจทย์ที่ท้าทายในระดับภูมิรัฐศาสตร์ระดับโลกนะคะสงครามที่กําลังเกิดขึ้นการแข่งขันระหว่างจีนและสหรัฐส่งผลอย่างไรต่อการคาดการณ์สุขภาพของเศรษฐกิจไทยคะ่ะวันนี้แขกรับเชิญของการสัมภาษณ์พิเศษวันนี้ก็คือคุณไอฮันโคเซ่เป็น Deputy Chief Economist World Bank Group คะ่ะจะมาประเมินสถานการณ์ที่เกิดขึ้นคะ่ะ Thank you very much for joining me, Mr. Kose. Thank you for inviting me. Right now, the whole world keep watching what will happen with the global economy. Do you have good news to share with me at all with this year of the global economic outlook of 2024? We have good news, indeed. When we think about what happened over the past five years, global economy faced a barrage of shocks. It started with pandemic. Inflation, interest rates, Russian invasion of Ukraine, the conflict in the Middle East—all of these shocks. When you think about, you would expect a major, major slowdown last year. In fact, at the beginning of last year, people expected a very serious slowdown. That did not happen. Global economy was surprisingly resilient. Growth was around 2.6 percent. So that's that's good news. There was. Uh, of course, a set of reasons that drove that outcome. The U.S. economy did extremely well. There were some emerging economies: Mexico, Indonesia, Brazil, of course, India. They all delivered very high growth rates. At the end, uh, growth was much higher than uh, what we expected and what many others expected. So, does that mean that the whole world do not necessarily have to rely on China because economic prospect of China isn't doesn't go well, but the whole world seems to be going strong? Now, uh, China last year delivered growth uh, slightly above five percent. So that's a you know a major number for an economy with the size of uh, China. Now, the challenge with China is uh, China has been. Delivering very high growth rate for a long period of time. In fact, not long time ago, China delivered double-digit growth rates. Now, uh, China has to slow and deliver sustained high-quality growth. And policymakers in China they are trying to deliver that. It is not easy to slow down a very large economy. When we look at you know Chinese economy this year, we are expecting growth around four and a half percent. Next year, around 4.3 percent. We downgraded our growth because consumption is quite weak in China. Because households are basically they have subdued expectations, and there are very serious problems on the real estate sector, and the implications of that for the real economy and financial stability are quite concerning. Now, with respect to China's impact on the global economy, obviously a big, large emerging market economy. Will have uh, spillovers when it slows down, but so far those spillovers have been contained, and we are hoping that uh, it's going to remain that way. 
What's your major concern regarding geopolitical uncertainty, the competition between the U.S. and China, the conflict which is happening in Ukraine, Israel-Hamas war? How does those conflict will affect the global economy? Uh, this, uh, of course, developments are really concerned. Overall, the increase in geopolitical tensions and the consequences of these tensions uh, became a major threat to uh, the global recovery. Last year, this time, uh, if we had this interview, number one risk we would focus on was financial stress. This year, number one risk is the conflict and geopolitical tensions and the escalation of this conflict, possibly affecting especially energy and food markets. Of course, energy and food constitute, you know, a significant fraction of consumption. When prices go up, in the case of price of oil, in the case of price of bread, lots of people affected by that. And implications for economic growth, especially in those countries, for example, they import energy. Uh, with that, of course, increase in prices, inflation comes, that has implications for uh, monetary policy. At that point, you know, major central banks are thinking of uh, reducing interest rates. So all in all, geopolitical tensions, a uh, major consideration when we think about the state of the global economy. So what do you reckon to monetary policy in terms of interest rate around the world? Should central bank of many countries reduce the interest rates? It's very important to put this in uh, context. Uh, what happened to inflation over the past two years? Inflation basically went up dramatically after the pandemic. Now, after peaking around, you know, last year, inflation has been coming down. And we think that that will continue this year into next year as well. Now, as inflation coming down, uh, we are also looking at what we call core inflation. If we take out the, you know, the prices of food and energy, these prices are uh, quite volatile, they change quite often. That component, the core price inflation, is still quite persistent. And when you look at major economies like the U.S., the U.S., uh, of course, Federal Reserve plays an important role and the U.S. interest rate is critical. It's the benchmark interest rate for global financial markets. Now, in the context of the U.S., labor markets are still quite robust. There is this concern with that wage inflation might be a problem. So uh, when we think about how monetary policy is going to evolve, we think that central bankers, especially in advanced economies, are going to approach reducing interest rates very cautiously. Uh, in all likelihood, they will start reducing interest rates in the second half of the year. As much as inflation is going to come down, probably it's not going to come down to levels uh, central banks are going to be comfortable with, especially in an environment they will continue to see persistence in core price inflation. You did mention the role of India that is a good sign for the global economy. So how do you project India's economy, especially this year, will it overtake China anytime soon? First, uh, how is India doing? India has been doing very well, delivering high growth rate over a period of time. And we think that India has the potential to deliver high growth for the foreseeable future. Obviously, however you look at it, among the large economies, India is delivering the highest growth rate, close to six, sometimes above six, uh, sometimes around, around 7%. And it will continue with the government's reform efforts and the big uh, projects when it comes to infrastructure investment, hopefully put private investment as well. Now, in terms of India's taking over China, of course, that will take uh, some time because China is still much larger than India. Uh, having said that, we talked about, you know, China slowdown, and that slowdown will continue. An economy with the size of India delivering high growth rate is critical for the global economy to sustain growth. So when we don't have China as a very large economy, accounting 
for a substantial share of global economy slowing. We need multiple economies to deliver high growth rates. India has to do that. Mexico, Brazil, Indonesia, you know, all of these economies need to deliver growth rates. So you can basically compensate the slowdown in China. Let's talk about Thailand. You mentioned many countries without mentioning Thailand. So what's the prospect you see about the country, about Thailand? Uh, for good reasons. Tourism recovery has been underway, but still a little bit uh, mileage there for the tourists come and you go back to really pre-pandemic levels. When that happens, of course, we are expecting Thailand to grow around 3%. Now, in the case of Thailand, we need to think about, you know, Thai economy's potential and meeting that potential that will require, first of all, uh, addressing the demographic challenges. It's an aging society, addressing that aging problem and bringing the type of, you know, labor force necessary to sustain activity will require interventions. Those, some of those inter interventions involve, of course, uh, increasing female labor force participation, increasing the participation of elderly to a uh, labor market, and then thinking about, you know, uh, role of foreign workers in the economy. Beyond that, uh, when we think about Thailand, there is great potential in terms of uh, innovation, in terms of investment. And all of these things could have significant positive effect over the uh, medium term. And if, of course, credible, uh, comprehensive policies are implemented. In terms of GDP projection for Thailand, it's not quite bright prospect. And with the GDP growth, it affects Thailand plan to become high income country because we have been trapped for about 28 years or longer. What's the possibility that Thailand may be reduced or downgrade to low income country? So um, we, don't, we don't see that anytime soon. Tha Thailand, you know, is uh, on average, of course, uh, still uh, the economy with a significant income level. Now, going from a certain income category to another one uh, requires a Herculean effort. This is true for Thailand, this is true for many other countries. You mentioned the middle income trap. It's not you know, trivial to get out of the middle income level and reach the high income level. And given the income level of Thailand, of course, you know, uh, we need to think about what is the potential growth? How much growth this economy could generate? We think that it could generate on a sustained basis around 3% growth, maybe higher. For that, you need to implement policies. You need to think about how you can, in a sense, increase investment in this economy, how you can find ways to push the technological frontier, turn the economy into, you know, more digital sectors, how you can reduce informality. And then uh, when it comes to fiscal policy, you would like to find ways to improve revenues, make spending more efficient. In a nutshell, like many other countries, Thailand needs credible, comprehensive policies in place. When those types of policies in place, Thailand will become a high income economy. We think that that will happen in late uh, 2030s, but it can happen earlier if, of course, there are credible, uh, comprehensive policies in place. When I say these things, I'm saying these things because it happened before. No advanced economy became advanced economy overnight. And the key is that authorities, the government, uh, on the financial side, on the monetary side, uh, thinking through uh, how they can, in a sense, undertake structural reforms to, in a sense, increase the rate of growth. So you mentioned it means that you you see Thailand shouldn't lose hope of becoming high income country. What should be the clear path for Thailand? Especially you mentioned that Thailand should have comprehensive fiscal policy. Yeah. What do you reckon? First of all, uh, never lose hope. I mean, the, that's, that's not a kind of a, a good prescription 
for success. Uh, you would like to be hopeful and you would like to be optimistic. The challenge is that when we look around the world, how countries, in a sense, increase their investment growth, how countries translate that investment growth into sustained economic growth, we see one key component, and that is countries basically undertaking policy measures in a coordinated way, thinking about, for example, fiscal policy. Now, when we think about fiscal policy, the most of the time, idea is that, oh, can we reduce fiscal spending? Yeah, that's important. But the issue is not just reducing fiscal spending. The issue is eliminating inefficiencies. Thinking through, you know, where are those inefficiencies? On the tax side, Thailand is still sizable informal sector. How you can basically expand the tax base? Now, this is important because uh, if you would like to improve public investment, you need to generate revenues. Otherwise, you know, you will bust the budget. And that's not something you would like to do. I think that this is not, you know, a prescription for Thailand. The, when it comes to economic growth, undertaking fiscal reforms, undertaking reforms on the financial side, undertaking structural reforms. I mentioned this demographic challenge very important for Thailand. And then thinking about, one, how to increase investment growth, two, how to increase productivity growth. And these things go all hand in hand. And for a country like Thailand, with the aspiration to become high income economy, the key is to think about what three, four major policies you put together credibly, implement it, with disciplined fashion and see the results. That's what happened in the past and it will happen in the case of Thailand as well. So you ask me a very uh, straightforward question. Uh, should we be hopeful? Of course we should be hopeful if policies are in place. Hopeful is good. At least we have to keep looking at the bright side of the country. But currently, Thailand still has so many, many traps many problems like household debt level of the household is quite high, more than 90% of GDP. How do you see that for the prospect of Thailand economy? Now, uh, there is no question that is a problem. And whether it's on the household side, whether it's on the private sector side, uh, when you have a high debt level, you are carrying a burden on your back, at the same time, you know, you would like to move forward. When you have high debt level, the issue is that you won't be able to solve that problem overnight. So in this case as well, the issue is to address the problem without turning this into a sharp, you know, slow down in terms of economic activity. And there, Thai authorities have their plans they just need to basically think about how to implement these plans and move forward. Right now, the Thai government seems to want to encourage Thai people to spend more to inject money into the economy. But probably the Bank of Thailand is quite hesitant and they want to maintain the interest rate as it is. So if you were to recommend this policy regarding interest rate, what do you like to tell Bank of Thailand or the authority here? I think the challenge is that whether you are in uh, Thailand or in some other country, is to think about the pros and cons of these policy interventions. The challenge is always to think about certain policy you implement, what are the budgetary implications, what are the implications for price stability, and then of course, you know, the central bank has to adjust its policies accordingly. In the case of Thailand, it is the same basic the prescription. Central bank has to look at you know, what can be done. Fiscal authority has to look at uh, what is the best way forward uh, within a medium term plan. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, there is no free lunch. There are consequences of uh, policies, but then the, the, the issue is that you know, uh, there are political economic considerations as well. So 
the authorities need to basically look at these trade-offs and uh, make a decision. I believe that you must have heard about handout scheme in Thailand of the digital wallet that the government tries to implement, but probably the Bank of Thailand doesn't want to comply or doesn't want to give green light very easily. But overall, how do you think of this kind of digital handout about $14 billion? But one of the main conditions is Thailand has to be in economic crisis situation so that this law can be enacted. But from your assessment, what should be done for Thailand? I think the, the, I cannot talk about the Thai case specifically. I haven't seen the, you know, the details of the policy intervention. Uh, but as I said before, the challenge when you would like to undertake certain fiscal intervention, it could be you, know, you would like to spend more money or you would like to implement uh, new taxes or you would like to reduce taxes. Uh, you need to think about the trade-offs associated with these policies. On the part of central bank, uh, the central bank has to also assess the pros and cons of introducing these types of schemes. Uh, the hope uh, is that the authorities work together and make that assessment and make an informed decision. The, most of the time, uh, when we look at these problems, what we would like to do uh, whenever there is policy proposal on the table, we would like to really study the policy proposal, understand the reasons, and then, you know, advise accordingly. The challenge here is that uh, when we look at the Thai economy, obviously uh, Thailand is growing. There are good reasons to expect that growth rate could be improved. And, and we are working, uh, you know, uh, on these issues to improve uh, economic growth in this country and in other countries we operate in. From capacity as an economist, as the leading economist of World Bank Group, you must have heard so many stories of conflicts, how central bank and the government see things differently. So mostly how would you encapsulate that or how would you explain that kind of situation? which will affect the economy of that particular country. I think that uh, when you think about the competing you know, objectives of policies, central bank uh, is focusing on price stability. Uh, that's what central bank needs to do, because at the end of the day, uh, central bank has certain tools, and those tools are geared to make sure, first and foremost, price stability is there, as well as uh, financial stability. On the fiscal side, when we think about you know, how we want governments to, of course, implement uh, fiscal policy, uh, there is this idea that they have a medium-term plan. If they have spending plans, they think about you know, how they are going to recover the revenue to close the hole associated with that spend. As long as these types of plans are on the table, as long as you know, policymakers are able to discuss these things and discuss the trade-offs associated with that, and as I mentioned, make informed decisions that is uh, for the good of the public, and this is true everywhere. Thailand is grouped as emerging economies. At present, how do you see the role of emerging economies around the world, and what's the force of Thailand at this current juncture? Yeah, uh, the, when we think about emerging market economies, these group of countries really uh, have been the main engine of global growth for a uh, long time. Their contribution to growth has increased significantly relative to 90s. In a number of cases, including Thailand, trade has been a driving force uh, when we think about economic growth. What we are worried about is how trade has been quite weak around the world. For example, last year, trade growth was almost zero at the global level. When you look at goods trade, goods trade really contracted. There were good reasons for that because uh, manufacturing was quite weak. When we think about you know, the post-pandemic evolution, services trade was quite healthy. Inventories accumulated because of that, people postponed goods consumption. And all of these things together 
had a negative impact on the overall goods trade. This year, we are expecting trade to improve. But still, whatever growth we are going to see this year, that growth is going to be much weaker than what we saw in the decade prior to the pandemic and in the 2000s. There are good reasons for that, but the issue of geopolitical tensions and the consequences of that and increasingly inward-looking policies implemented by advanced economies are a major concern for us. And we see that significant risks threatening global trade, of course, the growth in emerging economies. If you were to have to write or supervise the report about Thailand, can you just encapsulate your thoughts about Thailand for me, please? I think Thai economy has the potential, delivered high growth for a period of time, reached an income level. It needs to build on that record and it needs to basically think about what are the critical interventions that need to be made at this juncture put those interventions together. And when we look at the Thai economy, certain constraints are there. We talked about demographic challenges. We talk about uh, making sure that, you know, the tourism revenues are increasing. That's a cyclical challenge. Hopefully, it will be resolved very soon. And then, of course, adjusting the current labor force to this new economy in terms of having the, these type of skills necessary Uh, removing the barriers in the context of services sector, uh, trying to turn the, you know, the economy more formal that will help in improving revenues and uh, thinking through the you know, structural reforms. I think the, the, in the context of Thailand, there are good reasons to be optimistic when we look to the future if a comprehensive, credible, disciplined policy package is on the table. A lot has to be done indeed. Thank you very much, Mr. k o s e for joining me. เอาละค่ะเป็นการเช็คสภาพเศรษฐกิจของไทยในช่วงเวลานี้นะคะท่ามกลางความท้าทายในเชิงการแข่งขันและสภาพตึงเครียดในเชิงภูมิรัฐศาสตร์ระดับโลกแต่คุณโคเซย้ำนะคะว่าประเทศไทยยังมีความหวังที่จะเติบโตต่อไปอย่างแข็งแกร่งแต่ก็ต้องใช้นโยบายที่รวมกันเพื่อที่จะเดินหน้าทําให้ประเทศไทยเติบโตต่อไปได้ในเชิงเศรษฐกิจค่ะวันนี้ก็คือทั้งหมดของการสัมภาษณ์คุณโคเซ่เป็น Deputy Chief Economist World Bank Group ค่ะ